everyone. Give me one second. Let me pull up the chat just in case anyone has questions. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can okay. see your screen. Cool. Um, all right. So, hey, everyone. My name is Sabla Nagatu, and I am a third year PhD candidate studying immunology at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm also in a public health certificate program. Um, can you guys just see the screen or can you see the chat as well? Just your screen. Okay, good. Um, yep, so today I'm gonna first talk about uh, my background and kind of like where I came from and where my passions uh, started for sciences. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit or have a YouTube video on introduction to infectious diseases and then talk about my project that is currently ongoing here at Penn and how I do my, how I got started in RNA-seq analysis. And then I'll open up the floor for any questions. So my parents, both of my parents are originally from Ethiopia and they um, immigrated to the US in the 80s where they had my brother and myself. And I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, um, where I went to a high school in Tucker, Georgia, not many research opportunities. I just knew that I had a passion for science and math, like I was good at it. And my parents told me like, you're good at science, you're good at math. So you're definitely gonna become a doctor. And um, that's what I believed I was going to do. And during college, I actually had an experience. Um, I started as a chemistry major, and that was kind of challenging for me. So I switched to microbiology. And then eventually, I stumbled upon biochemistry and molecular biology. So that's what I did my undergrad degree in. Um, and during that time, I had an experience where my family and I spent an extended period of time in the hospital and I got to see kind of like what a doctor's life is um, from the family side rather than from the actual like shadowing of a doctor. And that kind of showed me that even though I loved science and I loved math, I wasn't that interested in becoming a science, uh, a doctor, sorry. So at that point it was like junior year of college and I was going to be graduating in a year and I finally did an internship at the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And um, that was also a paid internship. So we can talk more about that at the end if anyone has questions. But yeah, during that internship, I was introduced to whole genome sequencing in a microbiology lab. So we would get all these samples, food samples from across the US and we would screen them to see if there was any bacteria in them. And then we'd isolate bacteria and do whole genome sequencing. So if there were ever an outbreak anywhere in the US, we'd know exactly which kind of bacteria um, that, that, that outbreak was coming from. And then we could trace back and keep that food and um, bacterial infection from spreading across the country and even the world. So that was a pretty cool experience. And then following that, I did a post back in immunology um, so a post-baccalaureate program is also a paid program. After you obtain your uh, bachelor's degree, you can go to another university and you can take classes and you can also do research. Um, and for me, this was really important because by the time I finished my internship at um, the USDA, I realized I really like science, but I don't know enough about the immune system and immunology. So that's when I decided, all right, I'll do this post back program for a year and decide if I want to go to grad school. Um, and after doing this post back in New York, well, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the next slide, I then joined a PhD program here at Penn. So during my post back, I um, studied immunology and I was able to try, I was able to look at how um, during an infection, how different cells are told to go to that infection site. Um, so for example, if you stub your toe or something like that, and there's a bacterial infection or injury, um, my project was trying to understand how different cells are told to come to that site. And during this post back experience, I was able to actually present my research um, at a conference for the first time, I experienced the coldest winter of my entire life. 
Um, and then at the end, I was able to give my first scientific presentation in front of a large crowd. And, I, and it just showed me how I went from not knowing any immunology to being able to explain my science and my immunology in such a short amount of time. Um, and this also solidified that I wanted to do a project in immunology and study the immune responses specifically to viruses. And then later I decided to join a PhD program um, at Penn. And before I talk about that PhD experience at Penn, um, I wanna share a short video that introduces infectious diseases. So that way um, we, have, we all have a little background on what infectious diseases means. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at infectious diseases, what they are, some terms used to describe them, and take a look at a few different types of infectious diseases. First of all, what is an infectious disease? An infectious disease is a disease caused by an infectious agent like viruses, bacteria, parasites, or fungi. Infectious diseases are a global problem and in the past used to be the leading cause of death. There were large epidemics of smallpox, TB, syphilis, cholera, and plague that caused millions of deaths around the world. The 1918 influenza pandemic alone was responsible for the death of around 40 million people globally. Thankfully, advances in nutrition, antibiotics, immunization, food safety, housing, and sanitation has led to a massive reduction in infectious diseases. However, even now, they're a problem. In 2012, infectious diseases were responsible for three of the top 10 causes of death in the world. These three were lower respiratory tract infections, HIV AIDS, and diarrheal diseases. In addition to this, malaria and tuberculosis continue to affect millions of people. New diseases like Ebola and MERS-CoV have sprung up causing deadly outbreaks and killing thousands of people. Let's have a look at what happens when a person gets infected and talk about some terms that are used to describe infectious diseases. When an organism enters the body, some people fight it off with their immune system, while others can go on to develop disease. People are likely to develop disease if they have weakened immune systems. This could be due to drugs, age, or other disease. They're also more likely to develop the disease if they're not immune to it. For example, if they haven't had the disease before or if they haven't been vaccinated. The time from when someone gets infected to when symptoms start is called the incubation period. The clinical stage of the disease is marked by the on so I'm going to pause the video um, right there. So in, um, like I said, my parents are both from Ethiopia. And during my first trip to Ethiopia, which was in high school, I believe right after my freshman year, I had the chance to visit a lot of hospitals and a lot of orphanages and things like that. And what I noticed were that there were so many people who were affected by HIV AIDS, who were um, affected by malaria, yellow fever virus, and so on. And it was just so shocking to me that there were so many people being affected by infectious diseases. And I wanted to know where my place could be in, um, in, in helping those people. So like I said, I thought it would be a doctor at some point, but then I learned a lot about immunology during my post back. And um, what's really important for infectious diseases and trying to fight them is understanding um, the immune system that humans have and you know, development of different kinds of drugs as well as development of uh, vaccines. And like we all know the infectious disease that's uh, causing havoc on the entire world right now, which is coronavirus or COVID. Um, and a lot of research in immunology as well as uh, vaccine development has been really critical in us trying to get through this current pandemic. Um, okay, so now I just want to talk about, um, I I'm going to play this video and this video is going to go over the different categories of infectious diseases, and this will be really important for understanding kind of my project currently at Penn. Now, let's have a look at some important categories of infectious diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases of animals which, when transmitted to humans, can cause disease. It is estimated that over 60% of human infectious diseases are zoonotic. 
Examples of zoonotic diseases include diseases like leptospirosis, toxoplasmosis, campylobacter, and rabies. An emerging infectious disease is a disease that has appeared in the population for the first time, or one that may have existed previously but is rapidly increasing in incidence or geographical range. Examples of emerging infectious diseases include MERS-CoV, Ebola, Hendra, and new influenza strains. Neglected tropical diseases are a group of tropical diseases that affect the poorest countries of the world. Traditionally, they have not received much global attention, but continue to cause illness in the most vulnerable groups of people in the world. They include diseases like leishmaniasis, trachoma, sleeping sickness, and schistosomiasis. Vector-borne diseases are diseases that are transmitted from an infected animal or human to another person through the bite of a vector. The most common vector is the mosquito. Others include ticks, flies, fleas, or snails. Example of vector-borne diseases are malaria, dengue, sleeping sickness, and schistosomiasis. Vector-borne diseases are responsible for over 17% of all infectious diseases and cause more than 1 million deaths each year. So that. So this takes me to the specific kinds of viruses that I study. So the last category that they talked about in the video was vector-borne diseases. And the most common vector that we know about is a mosquito. Um, so the topic of my studies here at Penn are neurotropic arboviruses. Yes, uh, Danielle, you have a question? We learned a little bit about vector-borne diseases yesterday and the mosquito, which is the most deadly animal on earth because of the multiple diseases that it carries like malaria dengue and yellow fever yes that's awesome so you all have a little bit of background awesome so um since you all have a little bit of background can anyone help me out with what arboviruses might mean um i've heard of it jesus christ my memory i know neurotropic has to do with the neurons. So aboviruses, abro, what does the stem word, Jesus Christ. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> viruses that affect the neurons, I'm assuming. Maybe? Yep. So you're right for neurotropic um, are Neurotropic is anything that targets the central nervous system, which has neurons in it. So it could be a virus, it could be a bacteria, it could be a drug. Um, Sheree? Yeah, I think ARPU, like arthropod, uh, born viruses, um, remember it in the right way? Yeah, yeah, you're correct. <laughs> so, yes, so ARBO, um, the root word for ARBO is arthropod. So arbovirus is um, a virus that's transmitted to humans through any kind of arbo, uh, arthropod. So you spot on. Um, so this can be a mosquito, it can be a tick, and so on. And um, as someone said, neurotropic is anything that affects or attacks the nervous system. So you all have a little background, so I won't spend too much on the time on this. But a lot of uh, arboviruses are RNA viruses that infect mosquitoes, which can then go on to um, infect a mammal and the mammal will act as a reservoir. And this can get picked back up by the mosquito and eventually enter the human. And typically these cause uh, neurological symptoms because they target the central nervous system. Um, and humans are a dead end host, meaning that this human will either uh, recover and clear the virus or the human will die. So therefore we don't pass it on to yeah, another animal or back into the mosquito. And when we think about these neurotropic arboviruses, they really do exist worldwide. Um, so here on the left is a list of different arboviruses and some of these may be familiar to you. Um, and they exist literally around the world and they cause endemics. So does anyone know what an endemic is? Is it like a pandemic or an epidemic, but it's much, much smaller, so it's only like in certain countries? Yep, it could even be certain regions of a particular country or a certain uh, town or community. Um, yep, that's exactly correct. Um, so yeah, so endemics um, can grow into what is 
a pandemic. So that's how even with SARS-CoV-2, it's first started in a small region or town in China and, and then it and then eventually it spread across the world and became a pandemic. Um, so when we, we know that these viruses infect the central nervous system and in the central nervous system, there's been a lot of research on cells that call the central nervous system home or these cells are found in the brain. So this is a microglia and an astrocyte. And we know that these two cell types based off of research that other people have done have uh, immune immune responses that um, that then call in other white blood cells from different parts of the body into the brain during infection in order to protect against the virus. However, in our research, there is a, a gap in knowledge or we don't know much about how neurons, which are also abundant uh, cell type in the brain, we, there's not much that's known about how neurons can fight off uh, viruses or even if they do. And I think it's important to understand what neurons are doing because one, they're abundant in the brain, but also neurons um, compared to microglia and astrocytes, they have a very limited regeneration capacity. So this means that you're born with neurons, they develop into mature neurons and you can have one neuron for many, many, many years in your life. If that neuron dies, it can't just regenerate itself like other cell types. Um, so that's one reason it's important to understand how neurons protect themselves. And then another thing is that neurons are highly targeted by certain kinds of arboviruses. So that means that researchers have found that when you look at an infected brain, there's many, many neurons that will have virus particles in them instead of other cell types like microglia and astrocytes. So in my project, I study a virus known as lacrosse virus, and this is an RNA arbovirus. And this uh, arbovirus, it predominantly affects and infects children between zero and 16 years old and causes a lot of neurotropic diseases, particularly in younger children. Um, and it also predominantly infects neurons. So that's why in my project, I use this lacrosse virus as a tool to try to understand how neurons specifically um, have immune responses. So one of the key questions in my project is how do neurons fight off viral infections? And I use lacrosse virus to try to understand this. So now I have a short experimental setup um, for how I use genetics and sequencing in order to try to answer my uh, primary biological question for my project. So we use mice that are either um, wild type mice, meaning they have uh, the original genome that hasn't been edited using genome editing, or we can have mice that uh, are knockout mice, meaning there's a particular gene of interest and we can remove that gene using, um, using genome editing and then have a mouse that has its whole genome intact except for the one gene of interest. And then we can isolate uh, the neurons directly from the mouse and then we can infect them um, in vitro or in a cell dish, we can infect these isolated neurons and we can also treat them with different kinds of proteins. Um, for example, here I'm showing interferon beta and I'm skipping a little bit of the details so everyone can, um, can follow. And after we infect these cells, we can ask different kinds of questions. So here I'm showing a graph for something called quantitative uh, polymerase chain reaction or qPCR. And this allows us to measure how much RNA is inside of one of these infected neurons or inside of um, a group of neurons that have been infected with virus. And then we can also do something called a plaque assay, which allows us to see how many fully assembled infectious virus particles are in that same treated um, condition. And then for where the genomics comes in is um, you can mix different kinds of techniques together in order to try to understand different uh, expression of genes between neurons that have been infected versus neurons that haven't been infected and so on. And one example of this is um, we can first isolate these neurons that have been infected and we can put them in a tube and we can use different RNA probes that specifically recognize virus and they have little fluorescent proteins on them, we can use those to separate or to label infected versus uninfected cells, which I have here as gray and red. Um, and then after that, we can use different techniques that uh, use lasers in order to separate these two groups, the infected versus uninfected cells into different tubes. 
And then here comes the RNA sequencing, which I'm sure you all have heard a lot about. Um, I heard a little bit about it today earlier, as well as earlier in the week. And once you have uh, these two populations, you're uninfected and infected, you can do the RNA sequencing to try to understand if these two different populations are expressing different genes. Um, and then here, I just have a kind of cartoon of what kind of data you could get out of this. So if we say blue is condition, uh, condition one in blue is the uninfected cells, and then condition two would be the infected cells, you can use something called a volcano plot to understand what genes are downregulated in condition one versus upregulated in condition two. So in this case, we're looking at, um, we could isolate a specific gene when you're comparing condition one and two, we can um, look at a specific gene that's downregulated when a cell becomes infected or upregulated and start to ask more questions about why that gene might be important. And then another um, analysis that we can do is something called a heat map. So in a heat map, you can have all your different conditions being compared to one another. So usually, um, you'll put like uninfected as the condition you're comparing all your other conditions back to. And then you use, um, you would align all your different genes on in rows and then try to see how these genes change compared to my uninfected control. So for example here, uh, green would indicate a downregulated gene and red would in indicate that something is upregulated. So if condition two, is my infected cell type, and I'm comparing it back to an uninfected condition one, I can say that um, gene J is upregulated compared to, uh, in, in an infected sample compared to an uninfected sample. And you could go through and do this and try to find which genes are highly upregulated or highly downregulated. And again, try to understand how the neuron is trying to fight off that virus by looking at different patterns in gene expression. And um, when I first started with RNA sequencing, I understood how um, I understood how the data was collected, but I had no idea where to even start analyzing. And this was about last year, um, probably in April of last year, actually, I had no idea how to start analyzing. All I knew is when I did the RNA sequencing, I got these really extremely large data sets, and I didn't know how to even use R. Um, so I had no prior experience with coding. So the first place that I went to was actually YouTube videos. And I started looking up basic introductions to RNA sequencing and basic introductions to R. And then I later took a short course on how you analyze RNA sequencing. So um, this course is called DIY Transcriptomics and the entire course is online. And I'll show it, um, I'll show it to you all in a second. And once I had kind of the tools of understanding how to use R and understanding from a basic level how to analyze my RNA sequencing, I got to work in trying to understand or trying to find these upregulated and downregulated genes. And um, probably the most important step in my like uh, analysis was asking for help when I was stuck. <laughs> um, and help could be asking Google or even asking other like postdocs or other graduate students. Um, or really anyone that would answer my questions. And then I was able to analyze my own data. So now I'm gonna just show you all the DIY transcriptomics class. Um, and if you have time, I highly recommend that you all follow through and uh, try these out. So give me one second. So this is the website um, for DIYtranscriptomics.com. And you can literally go from not knowing anything about R to being able to analyze bulk RNA sequencing from start to end. So the way this website is set up, there's a faculty here at Penn who put this together. Um, and it is a formal course here, but you can definitely take it online for free and there's no sign up required. You literally just go to the website. Um, and I'll be a teaching assistant or a TA this fall for this class. So if anyone decides to follow along, um, you feel free to email me and I can help you get through the practice sets that come along with this class. Um, so each date, each lecture has a date, a watch by date. You don't have to follow it exactly, but I think it's a great 
opportunity to set your own personal computer up to analyze bulk RNA sequencing um, and just kind of practice and get those foundational skills just in case, you know, someone does say, oh, I have an internship available. You can say, well, I already know how to do R. So like it just makes you much more prepared and a better um, applicant to some of the opportunities that are out there. So yeah, so you would just watch each video um, and it tells you exactly what you need to download and everything. And then we will also have uh, data sets. Uh, that's a part of the class and it comes with every single file that you'll need. So you can have your raw files or if you feel like your computer is um, is not gonna, your hard drive, hard drive will not be able to accommodate this really large original files. Um, there are files downstream that have already been mapped and you can start from a later step. So it's not too harsh on your own personal computer. And then we also have something called scripts. And this is basically um, every step that you'll need to do to follow along in the class has already been typed out for you and you would just run it in R and just make sure you understand each step. Um, and all of that is available for free to download. And finally, all the videos. Um, yeah, when you click each lecture, each one should have, uh, should have slides at the beginning along with uh, the lecture video pre-recorded and, um, and any additional reading that could be helpful. And I guess the last thing I want to say about the class is that it's currently being updated for the lectures that are going to start September 1st. So if you do want to watch them, I highly recommend that you start um, mid-August to late August, just so everything is updated and properly uploaded. And yeah, with that, I'll take any questions. Would that link be posted on Slack? Yes, we can definitely post the link on Slack. Okay. It's free, you said? Yep, everything is free. The professor um, here at Penn has pre-recorded everything because he did that for COVID and it was just a format that really worked. So I've taken the class before. And like I said, I'll be a TA soon. So if anyone gets stuck or can't figure out the software on their computer, you can always feel free to email me. Does anyone anybody? Have <laughs> I think we were saying the same thing. Does anybody have a question? It can be about my post back or undergrad or grad school applications. Like I'm really open to anything. So I'm going to ask a question that many uh, I've heard a lot of. Uh, high school student I've talked to ask, uh, when you were in high school, did you know that you wanted to be a scientist? Not at all. I, so my parents had drilled into my head that I was going to become a doctor oh. um, <laughs> because I liked science. I liked math and that's all they knew. So um, I thought I was really going to be a doctor. So when I entered college, I was pre-med and I didn't know anything about science actually. Like I wish I had a summer opportunity because I would have started a lot earlier, but I didn't even know that you could do these internships and stuff in the summer. So my first science experience in a lab was actually junior year of college. Mm -hmm. Was there anything about you becoming a doctor that like specifically like turned you away? Yeah, um, I think there was a lot of things, but I think the main thing for me was I saw how quick the doctor, um, we were in the hospital for a family member for a while. And being on the family side, I saw how in and out the doctor was. So we didn't, you know, we knew his name, but he didn't know our names. And he only knew the patient, like my family member's name. And he would be in our room and then he's gone after like 10 minutes. And then we'd see him in three days or something like that. And I was just like, you know, I, I'm a very people person. And I think being in a lab, I have like lab mates and there's a lot more community. 
versus the doctor was just very in and out and didn't have any kind of personal connection with me. So that was, I think, the biggest uh, turnoff, if you will, for becoming a doctor. Okay, I was just like wondering, like, why did you choose not to? Yeah, it just, it was just too impersonal for me. Anybody else has a question? I see that Sharif says, wow, I'm really excited for these videos and tutorials. Yeah, I mm -hmm. actually picked them up as uh, I did the class because during COVID, um, my class or my research was paused because I, I do a lot of wet lab. And I found out that I could take this course and I went from not knowing anything about R to being able to handle my own data and even apply it to my own project. So it's a very great use of time. Yes. Um, so it says you're studying the immunology of people. Why do you not study it for the transmitter? Um, like in terms of like, why am I studying immunology in the brain rather than neuroscience? Is that the question? I think that's what the question is asking. So I'll answer it in the way that I interpret it. Um, yeah, so like I said, my passion for infectious diseases really started um, during my trip to Ethiopia where I realized, you know, a lot of people in the world are really affected by infectious diseases. And um, one way I could see myself contributing to our knowledge of how the body fights infectious diseases is by trying to understand the immune responses. And a lot of these arboviruses affect the brain. And we don't know that much about um, how different cell types that are found in the brain respond to viruses and try to fight them off. So that's kind of where my immunology slash neuroscience interest came from. Um, in terms of neurotransmitters, uh, did you study the effect of arboviruses on the arthropods themselves? I see, I see. Yeah, so there's other virologists here at Penn that um, study the virus and how it affects the um, mosquitoes or how it may affect ticks and things like that. But um, a lot of the times when we think about virus infections, you have the host side, um, which is the human in my case, and then you have the pathogen side, which is the virus. So those people who study uh, the virologist or people who study viruses, they are more on the pathogen side. And then my project is more focused on the human side or the host side. Does 